Welcome to the Shark Pod, the podcast that explores business and lifestyle design in Ireland and beyond. And now, live from Greystone Studios, here are your hosts, Luke Curry and Mark Baker. What is up, Shark Nation? Welcome to another episode of the Shark Pod. Very excited about this one. Um, our podcast guest today is Peter McCormick. How's it going, Peter? I'm good, man. How you doing? Good, good. I'm good. sorry I keep delaying this one. I'm so sorry. No, no. Listen, this is the this is part of the back and forth. And last time you uh, you delayed uh, the podcast, I was actually on a kind of a, a staycation in Wexford, and there was loads and loads of kids running around in the background, and I was kind of it was going to be kind of a shit show anyway. So um, this is uh, I think this is a lot better anyway. Mark Baker, it'll still be a shit show. <laughs> Mark, I can I can always excuse back injuries because I suffered with a severe back injury uh, myself. Um, dude. I got, I got back, I've got back to 85% now. So after about 10 years of working on it, <laughs> I think I'm at about 95% because I had the surgery. I, I took the cheat oh. code. Yeah. I took oh. the cheat code, got the surgery and I'm, I'm at about 95. Well, compared to where I was, where I couldn't sit down and, uh, I was like nearly crying from the pain. I say I'm there. about 95%, but I can't, I did my first proper exercise. There. I went on a 10 K walk. So, uh, yeah, nice. Getting better. Getting back. So. Perfect. And so just to give a little bit of an introduction, uh, Peter's uh, podcast, What Bitcoin Did. Um, if you're into Bitcoin, if you're into crypto, like you're, you're probably going to come across that. A million people a month are coming across it. Um, and uh, uh, Peter has like all of the income reports on the on the website and all that type of stuff. Really, really transparent. Uh, and really, really, like me and Mark really like the podcast as well because it seems like you're never like preaching at anyone. You, you're genuinely curious when you're in, interviewing people. Sometimes you start from the very beginning. Your uh, your podcasts are really accessible to people like me and Mark who are just getting started at the Bitcoin kind of journey this year. Do you know what I mean? So we're kind of, mm-hmm. uh, we always feel like we're a bit late to the party. What do you think, Mark Baker? Better late than never, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I think so as well. Because uh, there was a big little bit of a spike there at uh, Bitcoin uh, recently as so we're on the way back. Hey. But, um, but yeah, so like, for for you, Peter, um, the huge success in the the podcasting world was the was this your first kind of crack at a podcast? How did you get going on that? Yeah, I mean, look, this is all just just uh, an accident. Uh, I, I don't even know why I'm doing right. this as a job. Uh, yeah, it's all a complete accident. It's similar to you guys. Like when uh, I first got properly into Bitcoin, uh, I uh, there's so many smart people and I just did not understand what, what they were talking about. I would read their essays and their papers and listen to podcasts. And I was like, I've got no idea what you're talking about. So I was like, I'll do a podcast and I'll just ask the dumb questions. And, uh, and four years later, I've still not, not got any idea what they're talking about. So I'm still asking the same, the same dumb questions, but, uh, I've learned a bit, but it's, uh, it's been, um, do you know what? It'll be four years in November. Four months. In four months, it'll be four years since I started it. Uh, I think it was November 17th, 2017, I did it. And uh, what was like really just uh, probably like you guys, like at one point you were probably like, oh, let's start a podcast. And then you did. And I did. Yeah. And what it's led to is unbelievable. It's yeah. just unbelievable. It's like if anyone wants to go to the the What Bitcoin Did uh, podcast and kind of track the the amount of uh, downloads, the amount of uh, kind of revenue that you made over the months, which is really really interesting. I think me and Mark like that back in the back in the day we used to listen to uh, we still do sometimes um, Smart Passive Income, and he was like mm-hmm. uh, Pat. What's his name, Mark? Pat. Pat Flynn. Pat Flynn. Pat Flynn. He could be Irish as well. He was a passport <laughs> on the way to him as well. Um, like he put that all out, all that out there. I think when you put stuff out there it kind of it builds a little bit of a accountability or people kind of say okay this guy's a lot of people listen to this uh, podcast maybe it's uh, something i need to get on, on board with yeah I, so i used to listen to, i used to listen to pat flynn and uh that was when i started the podcast someone reached out to me and said to uh this guy i know has got a podcast said you need to do the pat flynn course about doing a podcast i was like i studied that and i was and as soon as i got like my first offer as a check it was like two thousand dollars. I was like, "All right, I think what I'll do is I'll just do what Pat does and keep a record of it." I can't. In some ways, I regret it now. Really? Because <laughs> yeah, sometimes I regret it. Because you got to okay. Because it's something that you got to go through every time, and you know, is, is there some pressure to keep it keep it going? Like, yeah, I mean, it's all right when the number goes up, um, and <laughs> you know, it's like online, and everyone wants you to fail and <laughs> wants your life to be shit. So, um, but. 
So I'll carry on. So, yeah, I mean, look, I kind of regret it because of the amount of work involved in doing it. It's like two days uh, every uh, every month. And uh, also just because, like I say, like people badly want you to fail. <laughs> like when you first start out, like everyone wants you to succeed. They're like, I love your podcast. I love everything you're doing. And then when you start doing OK, they're like, I want you to fail. And they want you to fuck up and lose all your money. So, um Sometimes, like I regret doing it, but it is what it is. I, I, I don't think I'll do it forever. It's. I think Pat Flynn kind of cut it out after a while. He's like, it's getting too. It's getting too. Um, yeah, scary because I'm, I'm doing too well, and my people will come after my family. I think that was his uh, his line. I can see that because it's kind of like, look at me, look how much money I earn. But we might have to take a take a rain check on that pretty soon because you're doing so well. So let's go back to the the the, the kind of the meeting uh, to veg of the the podcast really around. Uh, really around Bitcoin. Um, some of the stuff that I've been liking about the podcast is the, the type of diverse people that you have on the uh, podcast. Remember the last one uh, that was up was about people, you know, looking for second and third citizenships so they can really have a plan B. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of people out there that are are trying to build kind of financial freedom through Bitcoin, but also uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of libertarians or people looking for freedom uh, almost as much as uh, money out there. Is that the, the it would, what do you think about that? Well, yeah, I mean, look, Bitcoin naturally attracts libertarians or anarcho-capitalists because it is essentially freedom money. It is something that isn't controlled by the government or the state. So obviously there's a lot of uh, crossover with them. Uh, the Plan B passport thing is actually kind of interesting. And, and it's something that uh, stood out to me during the COVID situation and that for essentially for a year and a half, I couldn't travel. I wasn't allowed to leave the country. And as we know, most of the COVID rules and uh, is really just kind of like bullshit and like a drastic government reaction. And the way they've dealt with it is to, is to just put in these kind of like draconian laws, which Crazy. by the way, at the start I agreed with, but n now have become more and more obviously stupid. And so I am, um, I just don't like the idea of that being locked down in a country and being told I can't leave. Like, that is shit. So I was like, I know Katie, and she said, well, you can get a second passport. You can buy citizenship to another country, like Antigua. And I was like, well, Antigua's cool. I mean, it's <laughs> hot and beautiful. I'll have one of those. So, yeah, yeah I'm going to look into getting a second passport and traveling out there. But like you say, look, the, it's a diverse group of guests because – Bitcoin, the, you know, Bitcoin touches on a lot of things. It, touch, it touches on the nature of money, economics, technology, but also the politics, geopolitics, trade. There's so many different things that it touches on. So I kind of like expanding the guests I have into different subjects. It's really interesting as well. Like I was listening to that and they were saying they called the Antigua one or whatever. Um, I thought it would be even more. I know it's it's a considerable investment. It's like 170 grand or something to get the get everything done. But uh, like, it's not that expensive like, if it gives you the, the freedom to, to to leave if you want to leave your country, which seems like a, a human right, you know? Well, it's an insurance, right? Yeah. It's insurance to our oh, governments going completely mental and uh, uh, doing some crazy stuff. I mean, there are certain countries in the world where you would want to leave if you could. I mean, if you live in the Gaza Strip, you probably want to leave. Yeah. And if you're in Venezuela like a lot of you have already left millions have already left and others want to leave uh if you live in lebanon you probably want to leave uh for different reasons like for economic reasons but there's no there's no reason to say that you can't see an economic crash like a, a an economic crash at the levels that we've seen in other countries happen here in the uk there's there's you can't guarantee that we wouldn't have a, a inflationary crash like you've seen in lebanon or argentina it's it's possible you know, it's entirely possible. I mean, I don't entirely believe it, but it's entirely possible. But there's there's other benefits. I mean, if you base yourself in Antigua, well, you have no tax to pay. So it's definitely something I've looked at, but mainly as an insurance policy. Yeah, I think that's me and Mark have talked about this a couple of times as well, where I, sometimes I spend so much time trying to get out of paying tax rather than just trying to make money that it's it kind of tips over and it becomes <laughs> like the wor worst, uh, uh, worst way of uh, spending of time. But uh, the one of the things that I thought was interesting about your podcast as well, and kind of the Bitcoin uh, landscape, is this: there's all these, there's all these kind of uh, things that are happening that become, you know, you know, really blow up, and everyone knows about them. Everyone's talking about them. Um, I was talking to one of my friends who's really into the crypto space uh, here in Greystones in North Wicklow, and uh, he was saying you got to look into El Salvador. Um, and when I think of El Salvador, uh, I think of Ross Kemp on gangs. I don't know if you watch that. We're a big fan of Ross Kemp over here. Uh, what do you think, Mark? 
That's what, you know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Mark's like, yeah. Um, so maybe for people who don't really know what's going on in uh, El Salvador, and because you do be uh, hanging out with the president of El Salvador, you know, sometimes he's, he's, he's kind of your homeboy over there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Kelly, my homie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I've been out four times, and the first time I went, I was like shitting myself. I'm not going to lie. I was like <laughs> coming into the airport thinking, you know, because you go on the .gov website, what's the advice? It's like, well, you know, don't carry too much money. Don't get money out of the airport. There are roaming gangs, yada, yada. And I got there and it was just like any other country. Really? And look, and I know that's not entirely true. There are pockets of gang violence. There are large, massive gangs in El Salvador, uh, 18th Street. And I can't forget their names, but there are big gangs who control certain areas of the country. Uh, but I've never seen one. I've been four times now. I've never seen a gangster i've never seen a guy with his face tattooed and um i've just not seen that stuff i've had an amazing time every time i've been i've been treated well i am conscious that uh, outside most of the stores and petrol stations there's armed guards okay. i am conscious of that which we don't have here in bedford yeah. um but at the same time like you, you can travel to these places and uh, and operate with common sense and, and be fairly safe uh, it's a beautiful country. Uh, I went out there to see a Bitcoin project that expanded to the point where the government decided to make Bitcoin legal tender. And I ended up there about, what was it, Took about six weeks ago? When was I there? I can't even remember. Uh, and yeah, I interviewed the president, which is insane. It's, it's insane. fucking insane. Yeah, it's insane. Like, it's like this podcast is a joke. Well, not a joke, but just like, like you started yours. I just did it. And then four years later, I'm interviewing a president, which I cannot get my head around it's at all. It's such an interesting scene as well because the t like so I think if anyone wants to watch the interview, it's on YouTube. It's it's really it's really interesting to talk to somebody who you're like you're the kind of I guess a little bit your podcast is like we said before a little bit anti-establishment. I would say a lot of the people that you have on there, you know, the Michael Malice, the kind of anarchist, you know, mm -hmm. from YouTube, everyone would know. Um, and then you're talking to the establishment in some ways, uh, an elected president of a country, and it kind of it's a nice. Uh, they, although he kind of he seems to be kind of a radical guy, not just on the Bitcoin stuff. He's kind of yeah. Time will tell with him because there are people who've got criticism of criticism of him, and they're, they're fearful that he he is a autocrat. Uh, I mean, I met the guy; I liked him. He was interesting. Yeah. I think he is as a politician. He's more in touch with uh how to govern a country than most politicians these days he's young you yeah, know he's younger than me um he is uh, understands social media um he dresses down a lot of the time mm. he tries to relate to people and yeah El salvador has had some terrible presidents i mean of the last four i think one's dead two are in prison and one's hiding out in nicaragua because <laughs> they robbed the coffers because they were yeah. corrupt and stole the money so you've got a guy who's coming in now and said, look, we've got enough money as long as we don't steal it. And now he's introducing Bitcoin as legal tender. So like, he's a super interesting guy. I, I, I think you should be cautious about any politician. Yeah. I mean, I asked him, should we trust you? Yeah. But uh, I think you should be careful about any politician and, and, and be guarded about them. But compare him to the politicians we have here in the UK. I mean, I don't know what it's like in Ireland, but in the UK, I mean, it's a shit show right now. The US is a shit show. I mean, they're all, they're all in it for themselves. Yeah. Like we've had the same party. Well, so we've got two parties, but they do exactly the same thing um, since the Civil War here about 100 years ago. They have the same part parties in uh, in government. Just They just kind of hand the baton back and forth. Um, so there's, it's it's pretty stagnant here as well. Like um, It's not as bad as some of the middle, <laughs> central uh, Euro, or central um, uh, American countries, I'm sure. But, um, you know, we've got our ups and downs here as well in Ireland. If you follow our uh, politics, it's not, it's not always... Uh, you know, clear sailing. But um, so when you, we say legal tender, does that mean that people can go in and you can say, okay, I've got Bitcoin, I can actually spend it here. You have to have the ability to take it. Is it like that type of thing? Or is it kind of, yeah. like you could have a bank account with, they have to have kind of managed services for that. How, what, when he says that, is that kind of a real thing? Do you know? Well, well a couple of things that make it that report about it being legal tender. Firstly, is there's no capital gains tax on it because it's currency. Uh, and secondly, every economic agent has to accept Bitcoin. Now, they are um, making it easier for people because there are some questions around, well, how do I accept it? What do I do? So they've introduced a wallet, the Chiva wallet, which is the government wallet, which means you can accept Bitcoin, but immediately have it converted to dollars. So you don't even have to worry about it. You don't have to handle it. You don't have to touch Bitcoin, um, but it will be legal tender in the country. And 
And that means anyone visiting there who's got Bitcoin and wants to spend it, everywhere they go, everywhere will accept it, which is incred- incredible, really, when you think about that. A whole country accepting Bitcoin. What was their, what was their motivation to, to be the first ones to do that? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think there's multiple motivations. There's what they say and you know what you read into it. Uh, I think they recognize that cryptocurrency are not going away and they recognize that Bitcoin is king and uh, every attempt to stop it has failed. It just gets bigger and stronger and the network effects grow. So why fight it? What's the point in fighting that? So if you're not going to fight it and you're going to accept it, well, if you accept it, what are the benefits that brings the country? Well, they're a dollarized nation. So since the Civil War about 20 years ago, the, they're, they're a dollarized nation. They don't have a sovereign currency. Therefore, that's great for them for having a stable currency, which is quite rare in Central South America, but also means they don't have the ability like any other government does who does have a sovereign currency to print money as and when needed. Also, it means when the US prints money and debases their own currency, it debases the currency of El Salvador without them having actually done anything wrong. So things become more expensive for Salvadorans to buy, despite the fact that despite the fact that they've not actually benefit, benefited from the increase in the money supply. I think also another big reason is investment. If you look now, ever since like it was announced, all the Bitcoiners I know are visiting the country and they're spending money. That All the companies I know are looking at what is their El Salvador uh, policy? What are they doing? What's their strategy? Are they going to have a base there? Are they going to put people there? Are they going to consider a headquarters there? Uh, so what's going to ultimately lead is more money coming into the country, more people looking at the country, more investment in the country. And if Bitcoin keeps doing its thing every four years where the price shoots up, that Bitcoin in the country, which is held by Salvadorans, is going to raise up the standards and the wealth of the country. Because that's what Bitcoin, you know, historically, if you've held Bitcoin, any amount of Bitcoin for more than four years, it's usually increased in 10, 20 percent, 10, 20 times in value. You can do that to a whole country. So if you say over the next year, say 100 million is invested in the country and then say by, I don't know, by 2020, five bitcoin is worth 10x more that that 100 billion sorry the 100 million in the country is now worth a billion so i think it's a smart very smart shrewd move but not without its risks absolutely like i think that when you when you really think about that where you're kind of given the giving those people a chance to to have exposure to what's happening in the the bitcoin space like sometimes you think about our governments where it's almost like they're trying to restrict you from doing well all the time like we've got some crazy laws yeah. about not even uh, capital gains in Ireland is, is is what it is. But we've even got something called deemed disposal that you guys don't have, where every eight years, um, if you've got an ETFs, uh, the government charges you 41% every eight years, whether you sell it or not. What the fuck? That's a terrible law. <laughs> so it just cuts your... So you know, like the, what, what a lot of the investors are trying to do is, you know, save for 20 years and retire. But every eight years you get cut off at the knees at 41%. Um, that's ridiculous just put all that money in bitcoin every eight years that would be that that would be an amazing investment but that's that's the problem with governments they just like they're always on the take it's like what can we take off you next i mean i know look we've got to pay for this pandemic somehow right yeah somehow we have to pay for this pandemic richie sunak has to pay for this pandemic so how's he going to do it is he going to increase national insurance is he going to increase capital gains tax is he going to increase corporation tax Whatever he does, he's going to take from us. And if he doesn't, if he doesn't pay off the debt, okay, then what are we going to see? We're going to see this inflation of the money supply, which is going to debase the currency, which means that we're going to be paying it back because our our purchasing power has gone down. So either way, every time the government makes a mistake, we pay for it. And someone like him, Rishi Suno, I think his wife's worth a lot of money, like hundreds of millions doesn't affect him yeah. he's got no skin in the game with this it affects the guy it affects the guy with a, a small shop or a girl with like a small shop who's you know ha- has been closed for a year and has had to take out loans or whatever to survive and now you know is facing debt and has all the savings wiped out what savings they've had have have, have got um uh, are gonna have a reduced uh purchasing power these people they make decisions based on everyone else but really because they've got no skin in the game that's why they're making the decisions. We wouldn't have made these decisions because we know how it fucks us all. Yeah, but that's the problem with governments. Always on the take. It's uh, I couldn't agree more. But uh, I think even in Ireland, it is they're kind of insulated as well. As in, they've got their minister pensions 
that's you know pegged to inflation anyway. So oh, of course they have. You know, so it's all worked out. You know, uh, and they vote for their own rises and stuff. Mark, we could talk all day about uh, about bashing the Irish government, but like, what's uh, <laughs> what's the uh, what's the move for you, Mark? Are you are you convinced now? You've got your bank account in El Salvador. You're you're ready to go. You're you're going to be a hodler. We might have to go into a few of these. Yeah, no, I think everybody should almost have it as an element of their asset portfolio. You know, um, I think it's taken back. There's a lot more control in it than than other other things. Like, is that what drew you to it? it was the control of of Bitcoin taking back control? Um, it can't be kind here. of influenced. Is that what you mean? It can't be kind of messed yeah, up and- yeah, no. and that. No, no, I was drawn to it because you can buy drugs online with it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> my mate phoned me up and he was like, "Pete, Pete, there's this new website called the Silk Road where you can buy drugs online." I was like, "What?" He's like, "Yeah," <laughs> he's like, "It's this website. It's a bit like Amazon, and basically all the different drugs are down the side, and you select the one." He was like, "Do you know what the best thing is? That you can leave them a reviews, so you can order them in the order of who's best reviewed." Wow. <laughs> And I was like, what, what are you on about? He's like, I'll come around and I'll show you. So he came around and he showed me. He said, he's like, yeah, you need this uh, currency called Bitcoin to do it. <laughs> and I was like, what are you on about? He's like, yeah, it's this digital currency. You buy it and then you go on this website and you have to use a Tor browser so you're anonymous and you can buy drugs. So I was like, well, this is the best thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> so I bought some Bitcoin and bought some drugs. And, and so they just send it out to your house? Is that the... Yeah, it into like a, yeah, the, a mailbox. Yeah, so the, thinking about it now, there's some expensive drugs, I'd say. I tell you what, well, they are now, honestly. <laughs> if you, yeah, because I, when I first like, started buying it, it was like eighty dollars or eighty pound for my first Bitcoin. Uh, but uh, they were what also, year? What year was that? That was two thousand thirteen. So I wasn't really looking at Bitcoin. I was just uh, using it as a as a way to get drugs. I don't do drugs now, um, <laughs> but uh, back then I did a lot, and it was great. And it was a really easy way to get. And you know what? The thing is, it also changed my entire view on drugs because what it did is actually, when you think about it, it professionalized the industry. It did two. It did a few things. Firstly, because we know the war on drugs is a complete and absolute failure. I don't know a single person who says who does drugs, takes smokes weed, sniffs coke, whatever. Whoever says, you know, what? I'm not sure I'm going to do it tonight because I'm worried I'm going to be caught by the police. Yeah. Nobody does. <laughs> mm. But what do they do? They score. They hang outside Sainsbury's or Tesco. They wait for the guy who's always an hour late. And uh, and then sometimes they get absolute crap. Sometimes they get ripped off. Sometimes they get beaten up. I mean, it's like, it's the most terrible service ever, right? You've got – it's expensive. There's no quality control. There's no customer service. And there's no re- there's, there's no reliance upon the, the supplier to do to, to provide, a, provide a good service themselves. So what did the Silk Road do? Okay. It – it's it sorted out quality control because if you sold a crap product, you got a crap review. Okay. Secondly, it took violence out of the system because these dealers realized they could professionalize themselves, get a warehouse somewhere, go around to all the post boxes and and, and ship their product. Uh, it made it more efficient and it made it safer also because what happened was all these forums built up on the website that educated people about safe and dangerous drug consumption. There's a, the Drug Policy Alliance uh, did a re- review on review on it, and the, it's well worth reading. I mean, if you Google Drug Policy Alliance Silk Road, they'll explain to you how the Silk Road solved a number of problems with the war on drugs, which, like I say, is a completely failed war, which the U.S. has spent fifty billion dollars on, which has led to so much violence and death all through, uh, especially especially through South America. Now, look what's happened in the U.S. since they've legalized or decriminalized marijuana across the majority of the country. Has the world fallen apart? No. That, but you want to buy weed, you don't have, like, one option. Yeah, I've got some skunk, mate. You go into the shop yeah. and you've got drinks and you've got gummies and you've got different strains and you've got people behind the counter. Say, so what do you want it for? Sleep, anxiety, chilling out, giggling, whatever yeah. you want. They've got a product. It's completely professionalized the industry. So, uh, yeah, it's quite funny how uh, I used to like feel a little bit guilty about taking drugs and I had a full 180 on my view on drugs with this. It's it's such an interesting thing as well because when I went to, I live in Vancouver for a couple of years and nice. you know, they've got uh, weed shops there and when you come from Dublin mm. and uh, I guess the, the, the painter, the, the, uh, the picture you painted there of kind of waiting on a, a street corner uh, for shady people to, cause like who else is going to take that risk? 
you know anyway do you know if it's that type of uh that type of uh, industry like but um in vancouver it was kind of the opposite of that it was everyone was really chilled out about the whole thing um it didn't seem to, the society didn't seem to be falling apart um they had a, a really high level of uh service you know you go into these places they've got really nice couches you can sit down there's all this kind of infrastructure built around it where um it just seemed to work very well so you know it's because you've got competition when you create competition a... with professional companies then you have a, an improved product but the the way competition works in the drug market is if there's competition they kill each other yeah <laughs> or bit... stab each other or threaten each other or beat each other up because <clears throat> so the competition works completely in the wrong way with the drug market mm. where competition should be is it in the quality of the product and supply and bitcoin kind of uh it, it kind of gave us a uh, a glimpse into the way commerce could be if you could take away all, all of the uh it, it could it could just be completely free market where you can buy whatever you want um, so what other world problems can bitcoin uh solve in the future <laughs> good question that is a real uh, question yeah. <laughs> no no it's a good question it's a really good question i mean it depends how you look at it, it depends if, if bitcoin becomes a reserve currency from a country for a country i think the best thing it can do is limit what a government can do if if you know there's a currency such as Bitcoin, which is a harder, better form of money, you know over time that's going to store your wealth better than pounds or euros, then you're going to hold some of it, right? And when you're holding it, it's got, there's a difficulty with the government taxing it. So over time, what you would hope is that the government realizes that, all right, the more of this we print, the more worth it becomes, and we can't tax that good money over there. Crap, we're going to have to do a better job. We're going to have to provide a better service. So hopefully it leads to governments becoming service providers and not uh, uh, parents, yeah. <laughs> which is where the, the way they act now is, you know, the, I, I mean, I've become quite sick during the coronavirus pandemic of how the government has become this kind of nanny state telling us exactly who we can talk to, when we can go to work, when we can get on a plane, you know, what you know, almost coercive with vaccines. So, I think one of the biggest problems it can do is lead people away from thinking that we need big, giant governments to look after us. Another example is my, like my bank closed my my bank closed all my accounts down. I've been with them for twenty five years. Lloyd's Bank, go fuck yourself, Lloyd's. Um, <laughs> they closed. I've been with them twenty five years, and they phoned me up and they they wanted to know about all these transactions, what I was spending money on. And I was just like, look, it's none of your business. I'm like a grown man, forty two. Yeah. I've got two kids. I run a company. <laughs> I don't have to tell you what I'm spending my money on. I'm all right, thanks. And then they wrote to me and said, "You got six weeks, and your account's closed down." What was their? What was their? Like, so these are just they're saying, "What's the ins and outs of this? What's the?" Yeah, where you, what's this money? Where are you spend? The problem is, is the government has made the banks an extension of the um, of the surveillance system. Mm. So they've put in KYC AML restrictions because they want to try and trap criminals, even though like criminal the, the percent of transactions and money transfers being completed by criminals is is so low and the thing is you it's whack a mole game like if you if you're if you're a successful and well organized criminal you're not going to use the banking system you're going to use a cash system or whatever so um so anyway yeah they they're an extension the banks are now an extension of government they have to provide support to the police and that means if certain things will trigger aml requirements uh, a certain amount of money goes into your account a certain amount of income you have to prove where the income comes from and i just kind of got to the point i was like go fuck yourself this is like yeah. i'm a grown man i do not need to be telling you what i'm spending my money on uh, you're, you're a service provider to yeah. me you're, and, you're their uh, customer they they should be happy to ser service this and they get you know their fees to do so and that's the agreement surely you know yeah but as a private company they have the right to close down my account they're fine and so they did and so i'm not with them anymore but it, it was utterly ridiculous the way they did it and then you moved, I heard in your podcast, you moved to Revolut then, did you? I did. I did. Revolut had been great. Not had a single problem. I moved across within like two hours. And yeah, I mean, their technology is better. Their phone app is super, far superior from Lloyd's. And I've had a really great experience with them. I'd say they're absolutely shitting themselves. All of the, the, the kind of the old school banks, like I was thinking about this the other day, like all of the, cause I work with a lot of kind of tech startups in work. Um, cause a lot of those guys are using HubSpot. Um, and Revolut's one of our customers, one of our case studies. Um, and like when I've come across these types of new banks, like I'm just saying like this is, this is what's working. This is what, what people are, are wanting. Do you know what I mean? So I feel like there's no, like my, my bank of Ireland charged me, uh, I don't know. 12 euro a month 
I literally don't do anything with it. I just store money in a current account with these people. Do you know what I mean? Um, well, you look at these legacy businesses. What was their asset is now their liability. Uh, just the great example is always Blockbuster. Their asset was they had a shop in every town. So you could go and rent a video. No one could compete. Friday night, you'll go down there, flick through the racks of videos or DVDs when it became those, pick one that you wanted, get some popcorn, get some ice cream, go home, watch a film. And it was great. But somebody figured out that distribution can be done from a central place. Like Love Film did it. I, I think Netflix was DVDs before it became what it was. Yeah. And then it be, then it went to streaming and Blockbuster was screwed. The banks have the same problem. Their asset was they would have a bank on every high street. And before we had technology, you would go down to the bank and get your account and withdraw your money. You don't need them anymore. The only time I've been into a bank in the last two years was to go and say, why have you closed my bank account down? <laughs> and when I went in there, I was like, there was there was like three or four people in there. I was thinking, why, why do you need to be here? There's no need to – everything you need in banking can be provided online better, cheaper, and faster. And you don't have to be loyal to a bank, right? If you want to get a mortgage or a loan or insurance, you just go to a comparison site and get the best price. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think they're screwed, mate. It's, and I said that to, I had this experience recently, I got a new credit card in the in the post and you have to go and put the, you know, make a transaction or whatever. So I went down to the, the ATM at the bank and uh, it didn't work for whatever reason. I walked into the bank. Uh, I said to them, you sent me this, it's not working. Uh, and then she pointed me to a uh, a phone over at the side and I said, are you really worried about this? Why aren't you, you could help me, but you're, I'm going to a machine. This is, this is it for you. Do you know what I mean? And I was saying That's like, trying to have like a intervention here. You know, see yeah. what she's going to yeah, do. I think they're screwed. They're basically, they're relying on legacy customers who aren't great with technology. The likes of you, any, you or I, anyone basically under 40, and probably most people, even 40 to 50, and a lot of people even over that, anyone who knows how to use a mobile phone and the internet does not need a bank branch, probably doesn't use one. And over time, the competition is going to be between the legacy banks and the neo banks, your Revoluts mm -hmm. and your Monzas, right? And over time... People are going to move to your Revoluts and Monzas because they've got better technology because you don't need a branch and you get a better service. And because they've got lower costs, they can provide you a better service. And then eventually it will be between decentralized cryptocurrencies and the neobanks. It's so interesting. I love this, this thing. This, and this future is not too far away. Like we're kind of like mm. we're living. I mean, if you look at our kids, happening. my kids are what, seven and nine. I think I mentioned the word video shop a while ago and they're like, what's that? And they don't even know what that is anymore. And you're, say, so you're saying it's like just a matter of time. A, you can get a cassette mm. tape and a tan there. Didn't they used to do that? In, uh, oh yeah, <laughs> <in Black Tape. laughs> I don't know. I don't get it. We get your tan on and then head back with a nice DVD. But uh, so let's let's talk about so one of the things that I I, I was wondering about uh, Bitcoiners, uh, people are, that are holding for the long term, holding on for dear life, whatever uh, acronym you want. Hodling. Uh, what's the what's the kind of end game? Because I was thinking about this recently as well we had somebody on who was a kind of long-term investor you know investing for the long-term kind of the fire um uh, retire early uh movement and okay his his game is get to a point where you can uh, li live on four or five percent dividends coming in what's the kind of end game for bitcoin people is it to not have to uh have any income coming from the uh, quote-unquote kind of real economy and just live off like is there just because there's no dividends i don't i don't understand what's the end game here what's the what's what's the plan well you don't need dividends when your purchasing powers are going up 200 percent a year okay. <laughs> you just don't need it yeah. um so uh yeah i guess it depends on who you ask because some people's end game is about themselves some people's end game is about society uh personal end game for me i, I don't have a pension and the amount of money i'd have to put into a pension to to have something worth living on was 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 unbelievable i think i think i can't remember the person i spoke to but they were like how much do you want a year to live on i was like i don't know 40 grand would be good and they said well you need a pension pot of 2.2 million yeah. i was like huh <laughs> they're like well people are, i was like what i need to save up that that's not going to happen so i kind of accepted i'm either going to work for life right uh uh with no pension or create a pension some some other way and my way was with bitcoin so now I believe in the technology. I believe in people will converge on a better form of money. So I'm speculating on that. And my end goal is that it's a pension for me. For other people, it's to have enough Bitcoin that they can lend it out. And like you say, earn enough uh, on the interest to live on. Other people, it's just to make some money quickly and buy a Lamborghini. Other people, it's a better society, to have a better form of money, to, to 
rein in these governments and these uh, authoritarians and and such. So it's, it depends on who you are. I mean, some people, their focus on what Bitcoin can do for activists, how you can support activists in places like, I don't know, Nigeria or uh, Belarus, where, you know, Nigeria, they were campaigning against the the NSARS movement where the uh, secret police were basically abusing people and Bitcoiners were sending money to help them with their campaign. In Belarus, they were campaigning against Lukashenko, who's a di- uh, dictator, and they were sending them money so they can organize uh, strikes of workers. So the end game really depends on who you are. Uh, for me, it's, I don't know. I'm kind of lost in it all, just in just going along for the ride. I'm like half thinking about myself, but half just watching it all in amazement, the, the amazing things that people have created with Bitcoin and what it's doing for the world. It's it's interesting when they say like if you're if it's grown two hundred percent a year, it's okay anyway. You don't have to worry too much about your four percent cut off uh, yeah. at the end of the year. So uh, that was a good answer. But it's just it's one of those things that I think about sometimes when I'm I, like I I'm like you when I was in my kind of late twenties, um, I started thinking about pensions and stuff like that. And then when they when the advisor or whatever tells you it's going to take two point two million, and you, like you kind of just go oh okay, uh, fuck it, I'll, I'll live I'll live on the government. 200 quid a week then i'll figure it out or i'll just be rich in the future that's that was actually what i was thinking i'll just figure it out somewhere along the line surely to god i'll you know i'll cash in somewhere um so it it took took me a while to get kind of get going on it um but like mark what what do you what do you think what 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 would it take for you to to go all in and just every month forget about the because you, you said something, Peter, on your podcast, the, the, on one of the podcasts, I can't remember which, who you were talking to, but you are saying that at the end of the month, if you have more stacks of Bitcoin, that's the goal. It's not really in and out on a certain day, mm. on dips or anything like that. You just said at the end of the month, I want to have more Bitcoin. Yes or no. That's how the um, that's how the kind of game works. But Mark, like, what would, you, what would it take for you to do that? Because we're trying to get Mark on board here. Trying to no, no, I, I, I'm on board, but it's how, what percentage am I willing to put in, you know, of my available Excess. cash yeah. like would you peter would you be all in are you like or do you I have them now i kind of am now uh, do you do you not look at other investments in no. any like not even no, property not even i mean i own a house right uh but i'll be honest like I, i'm i'm not really sophisticated i'm not a sophisticated investor I, i'm just a bit of a moron and uh for me i was like i looked into bitcoin i was like this is the the best investment i can make over the next 10 years if if bitcoin does delivers against what people are projecting then there's there's nothing else worth putting my money in um and i'm I'm a terrible trader like i've tried it i'm rubbish Uh, i'm good at creating businesses Uh, i've always been okay at that so i was like what i'm going to do is i'm going to focus on business i'm going to make money and whatever i don't need for the next you know, two to three months, I'm always just going to keep putting it in Bitcoin. It's a bit of a money shot as well, mm. but it's worked out you've, pretty well. You've created a business out, out of Bitcoin then as well. Yeah. Surely. I mean, I've created you know. a podcast. Mm. And I guess the podcast is a business. Yeah. How, like, how, like, you obviously really enjoy Bitcoin. To, you've, you've gone all in. You're almost your, your day to day is Bitcoin. You're investing in Bitcoin. Do you, do you enjoy Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> I love Bitcoin. Yeah. Do you, you obviously enjoy talking about it. I enjoy it, it must I, consume your day, like so. I but yeah, but you know, when I'm not doing the podcast, I try not to talk about Bitcoin too much because <laughs> it's, it's like uh, it's one of those topics like veganism and uh, which a CrossFit, Bitcoin. Like it's just people yeah. get fed up of being talked to it. Just fuck off with your Bitcoin. They're just but I feel it. like. I have to go all in and almost be like that in order to be confident enough to go, to to invest that much in it. But I don't want that. I just want I've enough going on in my life. I just want to be get a certain amount of confidence in it and then just kind of set it and forget it. You know. I mean, look, my job is to talk about Bitcoin with people, and that's where the majority of my investment is. But I try and do. I try and not like make it everything I do in my life. I try and spend some time with my kids and not. I mean, they don't care. They only care about like having my Bitcoin when I die. That's what they care about. That's, so. actually, that's something to think about as well. <laughs> so, like, what? So, how does that does that work? Like, when you die, you just tell them, they leave them a map to the to the laptop yeah. that has the the stuff. Got on a them. map, a map with a with a code hidden, it, split around the country. Yeah. Uh, I can't tell you what my plan is okay. because that would that would give, defeat the purpose uh, secrets away. But um, but no, I I mean, look, 
I fell into this. Uh, uh, it's opened so many amazing doors for me. I've traveled the world with it. I've been to like 30 countries. I've been to the US like 50 times with it. I've wow. interviewed a president. I've made films. I've had the most amazing life because like I, my life was so shit before I started this podcast. My marriage had collapsed. I was a recovering drug addict. Um, my mum died. My mum died in Sligo. Um, Sligo That's Hospital. Uh, my yeah, my wife had left. Well, I kind of kicked her out, but whatever. That's a long, longer story. But like everything was basically shit. Like my company collapsed. Uh, if I had a dog, it would probably have been run over. Like everything was <laughs> shit, and I didn't know what I was going to do for work. Uh, like, I, honestly, life could not be better. Uh, could, could not have been worse. And I'm in Ireland. I'm in Donegal, like grieving my mother, and just stumbled across Bitcoin again and went down the rabbit hole and started a podcast and it's honestly i I don't even know how to explain it but it's i feel so lucky because life was truly awful at that point and it's given me this whole new life which i'm so grateful for it gave me something to focus on i suppose yeah definitely i mean the Mm. podcast was something to focus on and then it just did really well uh and, and opened all these doors so i owe a lot to bitcoin but I owe a lot to the people in Bitcoin who've helped me do this, and yeah, I mean, I don't know, I don't know where. I mean, I might completely fuck it up in, in a year; it'll, it'll it'll be gone. But the last four and a half years have been magical, mm. and the last three and near three and three quarter years of the podcast have been unbelievable. And I don't know what happened next year. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, hopefully at some point I can do some stuff which isn't Bitcoin. I'd like to make some films and do some interviews which isn't about Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, so and you possible. do have another podcast uh, as well. Yeah, but I've, I've stopped doing that one. I did that for a uh, year and a half, Defiance, because I wanted to do non-Bitcoin subjects, but running two podcasts is a nightmare. So basically, I need to evolve this one to the point where I can do other subjects, and I will do that. I'm like, you know, Michael Malice was a step in that direction. Yeah. Um, uh, Julian Assange's father and brother was a step in that direction. So interviewing uh like there's a, almost like asymmetric topics of you know freedom and human rights which kind of sit alongside bitcoin which i'm just venturing in, into yeah that's cool so i want to be respect for your time we usually uh yeah. I'm, I'm interested about this one though because we usually kind of like a, a lightning round at the end of the shark pot uh, before we f- uh, finish up uh mark baker what do you think what's on your mind here what's the what's the what's the what's the questions on the tip of your tongue here well, I'm actually, this isn't a lightning round. Like, the lightning round tends to be not so lightning. So they're kind of fast questions, but they're long answers. Such an, that's like such the most Irish way you could have explained that. <laughs> it's no, but I'm actually fascinated. Somebody who lives, on a, I don't know if it's the right word, an alternative lifestyle to, you know, someone who might work in a bank or whatever. Outside the matrix, like, you know. How, what does your day look like, the average day of, of Peter McCormick? Well, today I, I just felt a bit ropey when I woke up. So I just got up, watched some of the Olympics, and then I've watched back-to-back episodes of The Handmaid's Tale and, and talked to you. I just didn't do any work today. I was like, I just don't feel good. So I, I just didn't do any work today. The average working day, then? Oh, the average working day. Uh, I mean, it depends. If my kids are with me, uh, I would normally just get them up, get them to school, go through my emails and uh and deal with those, which takes about an hour. I then go on Twitter and argue for a couple of hours, and then I maybe record a show, uh, speak to some sponsors. I, I, honestly, I don't know. I just uh, the really interesting thing, the the b- biggest blessing of this whole thing is like control over your time. Like there is no normal day. I just I have to record three interviews a week. My team gets them out, and I kind of do whatever the fuck I want the rest of the time, which is a real blessing when mm. you when you've got control over your time, it's way more important than money. Like I've been broke and I've made money and I've been broke again. And honestly, happiness is never really correlated to how much money you had. Like I've had nice cars and then within a month, that's just the car you drive and you forget about it. And also it, you never really, they never, these things never really make you happy. Mm. Um, but having control over your time is an incredible gift. Like I've just had my back f- fixed. I can sit in the middle of the day to go down the gym for a couple of hours if I want, or I can just go and lay in the park. Uh, today, I actually, I, I missed out. I went for a 10K walk today. I just went out this, in about 11 o'clock and did a 10K walk. Mm. Like having control over your time is incredible because I've done the rat race. I worked in London. You get up at six in the morning to get the seven o'clock train, travel two hours to work, work 10 hours, travel two hours back, shattered, go to bed, and just like it's shit. Mm. It's really yeah. shit. To get up every day and go, what do I want to do today? 
mm. and just do it is 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 amazing. And that's why I tell anyone, if you're thinking of starting a company up and you want to do it, go and do it. Sometimes you work harder than you've ever worked, but and sometimes you make less money. But but don't do it just to make money. Like do it for a lifestyle because it's it's incredible. So that control over time is the best thing. That's a really wishy washy answer to what you asked. But basically there's no normal day. I just mm. you know, I could be you know, in a three weeks I'm going back to El Salvador. So my day there will be very different. I'll get up and have a coffee and do my emails. Then I might go for a walk on the beach and sit in the pool. And then I do two interviews. And then another day I'll be just sat in my hotel room doing interviews all day or working all day. It just changes. Mm. Uh, my only deadlines are is my interviews every month, which is, is three a week. At the end of the month, I've got to pay people and get paid and do my invoicing and do my stats. Everything else is a choice. Mm. Wow. And I think something really occurred to me when you're talking about getting on the trains and everything like that to London, like you're also at that stage when you're putting 10 hours uh, of a lot of that busy work at the office or whatever, um, or trying to impress people there. And it's very like, that's the most competitive spot because there's thousands of people trying to get that job, trying to impress that boss, try to get those, those sales figures, you know? Yeah, I think it's, and it, it's interesting. And you were your whole life. Like my dad, my old man, worked for an airline, right? He worked for Monarch Airlines for what? I don't know, thirty odd years, thirty five years. He retires to Ireland with my mum, and within what I want to say, less than ten years, she gets cancer and dies. I mean, they. My dad was sixty one when he retired, which would have made my mum fifty nine. And she died when she was 68, I think. So that's nine years afterwards. So six years into their retirement. So 35 years slog, raising three kids, mm. working long shifts, whatever. They retire. And then six years later, mum gets cancer. Three years after that, she's dead. Like, that's that's bollocks. And some mm. people have even worse luck. Some people retire and then drop dead the next day, right? Like, mm. Or, you know, they work their whole life and then their pension gets destroyed because of yeah, whoever that's gotta be um, the big, that's a big one that's true. Yeah. So when you when you, when you hear about that and you're like if you say, save into a defined pension for 40 years and then it's someone either messed it up or ran away with a piece of it or these things happen mm -hmm. and so well the yeah the you know, government inflates your money away and that's why i like like working for your retirement i think is a crazy idea because you're old and you can't do much anyway you just, mm. just gotta live now just got to live now and enjoy every day as much as you can. So just try and find a job you like and stuff like that. Yeah, I don't know. I'm get, getting all like profound. Now. No, I know. I like it. I think it's at the... <laughs> that happens at the end of the podcast. <laughs> what, so, Mark, one more question, then we got to go. Okay. Okay. If you could advise somebody to learn one skill, what would it be? Oh, that's a brilliant question. Can I, can I answer that, but also give another answer for a question you haven't even asked right <laughs> yeah go for it <laughs> but, it, but it relates to it it relates to it okay yeah. so the skill i would say to learn which is a tough skill but definitely learn is is sales and the reason i say sales is important is like every business has to sell something and the seller the salesman is usually the person most rewarded and the best salesperson usually always does really well but, but in, t in in learning sales, you just learn to get on with people. You learn to deal with people. You learn to have a, you know, to be able to hold a decent conversation. Uh, I've always been a salesman. Uh, and not like a slimy, like, car salesman. Or, you know, not to say all car salesmen are slimy. My dad just got a car in, in Ireland, and he was lovely. But just <laughs> generally speaking, it's just, I think, if you know how to sell, you know how to do deals, and you know how to build a business. But... The, the answer I want to give, which isn't the question you've asked, is uh, nothing beats hard work. So I've said get control of your time. The first two years of this podcast, I work like, like a dog, 80-hour weeks. Now it's, it's getting a lot easier. Whatever you choose to do, you're probably going to have someone you're competing with. The w one thing you can always try and win on is hard work, putting more hours in than they do just work 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 your ass off and you might think oh what do you do with a podcast well it's like how to have the best website you know how do i how do i ensure when people are searching for bitcoin mine comes up there so i have to do seo you know how do i make it look professional well, i have to have good graphic design i used to do all the graphics right what makes a good interview what's the best equipment you know every single element of what makes a good podcast you can go through it 
and you can go, am I doing the best there? The best you might think if, if somebody's thinking of starting a podcast, they might think, oh, all I need to do is press start record and put it on YouTube and Spotify and I'm done. You can do that, but you can also do all the other stuff in terms of marketing and, and you can go and watch other interviews, study how people interview and learn from them. You can go and watch Joe Rogan every week. Every interview he gives, he's pretty much given you a lesson in how to do a good interview. Yeah. You can go and you know you can go and read books by Larry. Is it Larry King? Oh, I forget his name. The guy who died. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Larry King. Um, there's like you can just go out and study and become better at you doing what you're doing. So what I say is learn to sell because that's useful anywhere and just work hard. Work, work hard, if you can work hard at selling, then you're you're golden. Ooh, I know you got it. You got it made. You're gonna crush. It builds it. resilience yeah. as well, Peter. I think sales. Yeah, it does. Yeah, mm. uh, yeah. Well, most people suck at sales because they don't like being told no. Yeah, it's like it's embarrassing. It's, it's a bit like nobody really likes to go up in a pub. They see like a guy, they're quite fancy. You don't really want to go up and go, yeah, hi, I'm Peter. Do you want a drink? Because you just feel like a knob doing it. Yeah, and also if they say no, it's like. It, it just destroys you. It's, trying. <laughs> it's like, imagine being out with your mates and that happens. You're just like, I wouldn't want to go home now. It's rubbish. Yeah. Especially- so nobody really likes it. And the thing with sales, nobody likes to nobody likes to ask for mm. the sale. Like, yeah. I used to be good at sales. Uh, I used to always just say, like, what, is it you, what is it you're looking for? Like, what is going to win this for us? T- tell me. It, I mean, they, and then they, they're telling you what they want, want to do. Yeah. And, then, and then all you have to do is use their product. Go back and say, I've used your product. Here's... Here's me proving I've used your product, and this is what you want to do, and this is how we're going to deliver it. And I, we used to win nearly all of our pitches. It's it's so it's such an interesting thing when you say that the most people that don't want to it's the rejection thing, um, just yeah. as especially in Ireland because if your friends see you get rejected, I mean the slagging could go on for days. Do you know? Dude, it's, yeah, it's, they're gonna they're gonna crush you. Yeah, right? it's coming. You're, they're coming at you. You know. But I had a friend who used to say um, he'd see a girl in a club and or a bar or something, and he'd say, you know, she's not leaving without rejecting me. That's his his thing, but she's gonna have to. Ooh. She's gonna have to turn me down. She's. I'm gonna put it's it up num- to her. You know, oh, numbers so. game, man. He played the numbers. <laughs> yeah, he certainly did. Uh, but one more question before we go: Would you prefer a yeah, shark po- uh, a shark pod uh, t shirt or a mug? Oh, the mug. I'll use the mug every day. Perfect. All right, Peter. Thank you so much for joining us today on the on the shark pod. Really, really interesting. Love the podcast. Uh, we're big supporters of your work, us. and uh, we'll get that mug out to you as soon as possible. Well, but, hopefully, we'll get a beer in at some point. I'll come over. Hundred percent. Yeah, we'll be. I've not been to Tony Wicklow. Hill. Have you never been to Wicklow? No, never been to Wicklow. There's a well. Well, uh, we'll take this off air. It's going to be great. North Wicklow is where it's uh, where it's at. Where we <laughs> like to hang out. It's a it's a beach town, so it's all chill. All right, cool. Talk to you soon. Peace. Peace Thanks, Mel.